So shortly after the children of Israel were freed from the hands of Pharaoh, God brought them to the base of Mount Sinai, and there God began to give them some specific instructions. In the book of Exodus chapter 20, God starts giving Moses uh, a load of commandments. If you've listened or read through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, it's just Commandments after commandments after commandments, there's a lot there. Exodus chapter 20, we get the Ten Commandments. 21, he gives laws about servant and uh, physical disagreements. 22, 23, he gives instructions about property, Sabbaths, feasts. 24, he confirms a covenant with Moses. And we understand that covenant to be the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. That's simply what a testament is. It's an agreement. It's a covenant. Then obviously we get our New Testament. Jesus Christ brings us the New Testament, our New Covenant. But in Exodus, uh, basically 20 through 24, we get that Old Covenant. But then in 25, uh, chapter 25 through, through 30, God shows Moses a plan for building a place that God would dwell and meet with his people. God gave Moses some very specific instructions on how this building should be constructed, how the items in the building should be constructed, and how the people that would work in this building should operate. Okay, so we're going to go to our text, which is Exodus 25, verses 1 through 9. Exodus 25, verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. So right away, the Lord, for his sanctuary, his place that he wants to meet, this is what I have underlined in my Bible, of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. God does not want and demand a sacrifice. He wants a sacrifice that is given freely to him. Everything that the temple was built with, everything that the tabernacle was built with, it was all freely given. He does not demand people to worship him. He simply just asks. So right away, have the children of Israel bring an offering that every man giveth willingly with his heart. So verse number three, and this offering you shall take of them gold and silver and brass and purple and, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the lamps, spices for anointing oils, for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplates. Verse number eight is our text verse. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and after the pattern of the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. God wanted a sanctuary so he could dwell among his people. In this study, we are going to look at God's sanctuary, where God dwells, and the different aspects about his sanctuary. So first, we're going to look at what is a sanctuary. Okay, This Hebrew word, uh, sanctuary, it's mechdash. I am not a Hebrew scholar, nor do I act to be. It simply means a sacred place, a holy place. God wanted a sacred place, a place set aside specifically for him, and a holy place where there was no corruption, no disobedience, and it was built from the offerings of his people. As, as uh, we look and understand how, the order of which God set this up, and the instructions, and the severity of it, anybody that would go against especially the priests that would go against the order which God set up, his uh, uh, ordinances and his sacrifices, it was serious. They would die if they didn't practice it perfectly because this was a very special, sacred place. He wanted it set aside specifically for him. Why, ultimately, did God want a, sanctu a sanctuary? He wanted to be close to his people. God did not simply want to be up high in the sky, looking down on his people, waiting for them to make mistakes so he could judge them. No, that was not the case for the children of Israel. It was not the case throughout the entire Old Testament. It wasn't the case in the New Testament, and it's not the case now. God wanted to be close to his people. God always has wanted to be close to his people. And we ask, how close did God want to be to his people? Genesis 3.8, the, 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 the fall of man. This is the first interaction of God after man sinned. And they heard the voice of the Lord, or God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. How close is that? They could hear him walking in the garden. Here, when the Lord is talking with Moses, and 
throughout uh, uh, Moses' life. We had this as just one example of many. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. How close did God want to be to his people? He wanted to be very close. Drawing conclusions from Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we always get a perfect example of what God originally intended. God originally intended for us to be this close to him. That's what he wanted. He wanted to be that close. God intended to be close to his people in his sanctuary. And this was going to be a way for him to be able to be close to his people. And that's why he was so specific on his instructions. It's not just a big rule book and he was waiting for somebody to mess up so he could just kill somebody. No, he wanted to be close, but he needed to be a a sanctuary that was sacred, it was set aside, it was holy. Okay, so what does the sanctuary of God look like? Okay, there's three parts. An outer part, an inner part, and an innermost part. As we look at these different aspects, we're going to obviously see that we have the tabernacle that was set up this way. We have the temple that was set up this way. But ultimately and originally, it was man that was set up this way. It was always been this way. An outer place, an inner place, and an innermost place. Okay? As we look, uh, we're going to notice that the sanctuary, the temple, uh, the uh, tabernacle, man, they are all made up of these three uh, vital parts. We're going to look at first the outer place. Today, we're going to be looking at this in these three areas, the temple, the tabernacle, and in man. So first we have the outer place of the tabernacle. I am not going to go into nitty gritty details. If you would like more nitty gritty details, go ahead and read or listen to Exodus and Leviticus numbers and you'll be able to get a little more functionality and the finite pictures within these details. So if you want to flip back and forth, you're welcome to. So Exodus chapter 27, we get this court. It's an outer court. Exodus chapter 27, Verses 9 and 10 is where I'll start. And thou shalt make a court of the tabernacle. And on the south side, southward, there shall be hangings of the court of fine twine linen and a hundred cubits long for one side. And the twenty pillars thereof and their twenty sockets shall be of brass. Uh, hooks of the, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. The next seven verses, uh, again, you can read on your own time. The next seven verses give us more detail on how this court is to be constructed. Okay, verse number 18, if you want to cast your eyes down there. Verse number 18, the length of the court shall be 100 cubits and the breadth uh, 50 uh, everywhere and the height five cubits of fine twine linen and their sockets of brass. So we get a basic view of what this court looks like. It's constructed of pillars, Uh, With fine linen on the outsides, it's 100 cubits long, which is uh, a cubit is basically 18 inches, so a a foot and a half. So it's 150 feet long by 50 feet wide. This is the outer court, okay? Seven and a half feet tall is is, is the height thereof, okay? So inside this court, there's a few specific things that are inside it. It's actually kind of empty if you think about it. There's really not a lot there inside of this court. So first we have a gate. We're going to see that. You're right in Exodus uh, 27. Inside the description of the court, you'll see first there is a gate. Verse number 16, And the gate of the court shall be hanging 20 20 cubits of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen wrought with needlework, and their pillars shall be four and their sockets four. These colors are not just God picked out some random colors for the color of this gate, right? Blue is wisdom and authority. Purple is royalty or kingship. And red is sacrifice. There was uh, only one way into the tabernacle and one way out, right? And it was through this gate of blue, purple, and red, scarlet. Next, we see there's an altar. If you want to flip there, you can go to Exodus 40. Exodus chapter 40, verse number 6. Our next two are going to be Exodus 40, verse 6, and Exodus 40, verse number 7. They're right next to each other. So if you want to flip forward to Exodus chapter 40. Exodus 40, verse number 6. And thou shalt set the altar of burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. 
So the first thing that you would see when you walked, if you were to walk into this tabernacle, the first thing that you would see right at the door is this altar of burnt sacrifice. Next thing that you would see, it'd be verse number seven of chapter 40, is going to be a laver or a washing basin. Verse number seven, thou shalt set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. So between the tabernacle itself and the altar is this laver or this washing basin. This is where the priests would clean themselves physically before they would walk into the temple. Again, inside the temple, it's holy, it's sacred, it's set aside. There's procedures for washing to make sure that you are clean. And the Lord had this set up for specific reasons, right? So this is our basic outer court. There's a lot more in detail on, on the items themselves. Again, if you'd like to search that out yourself, you're welcome to. But this is the basic construction. You're going to notice now the temple. The construction, even though it's much more grand, it's a permanent structure, the temple is going to be very simple. The design is very simple to the tabernacle. The temple was a permanent structure that David wanted to build for the Lord. Um, but the Lord did not allow him to build that. He wanted a permanent place because he wanted God to be able to dwell with them permanently in a permanent place that didn't move around and he didn't have to go fetch all the things whenever he moved. He just wanted a place for God to be. And he wanted a place for everybody to come and worship him there. It's, it's a good thing to have, right? Although the concept was the same, there's a few variations in the construction. In this construction, there's an outer and an inner court. It's still the outer, but there was like a, a couple of tiers to the porch here. And we're going to see that you don't have to turn there, please. And, but it's 1 Kings 7, verse 12. And the great court was about three rows of, uh, of huge stones and the row of cedar beams, both for the inner court of the house, for the Lord and the porches of the house. Then we see that there is a gate, which is... The uh, best uh, passage that I found for this gate, because it, it talks about it, but in Acts chapter 3, there's a certain lame man from his mother's womb he's carried, whom he laid daily at the gate, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that enter in. And that's where they say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. This man is laying at the gate here. And this gate in Acts is called beautiful. That word beautiful, what we think is, you know, well, it's good looking, it's comely, it's, you know, handsome or, you know, pretty. Here, this word beautiful, it's the word horeos, which means to bloom and uh, to have the vigor of life. We also, the only other time in the New Testament we see this word is when Paul says, how beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel of peace. Feet are not beautiful, as in handsome or pretty, right? How beautiful that bloom and that blossom, that new life, that new beginning, that vigor of life that comes from the feet of those that share the gospel. And here, as you come into the temple, this gate, they called it beautiful. This uh, gate represents new life and vigor. Then as you come into the temple, you would come up the steps. You would have the altar, which is going to be Second uh, Chronicles 4, verse 1. This altar is a little different than the one that was in the tabernacle. Moreover, he made an altar of brass, 20 cubits, the length thereof, which is 30 feet wide, 20 cubits, the breadth thereof, which is 30 feet, and 10 cubits tall, which is 15 feet tall. So this is a massive altar, 30 by 30 by 15. There were steps to get up onto this altar. I encourage you to look at pictures, too. If, you, uh, if you're like, I don't really have a hard time picturing it, look at pictures. It's, in, it's incredible. The labor system was a little bit different. Uh, 2 Chronicles uh, 4, verse 2 and 6. Also, he made a molten sea of 10 cubits, about from brim to brim, uh, round in compass, and five cubits, the height thereof, and a line of 30 cubits did combass around it. So he made... Uh, Solomon made one huge basin, and that's this basin here, and he called it a molten sea. But, verse number six, he also made ten lavers and put five on the right and five on the left to wash uh, in them, such as uh, they offered for burnt offering. They washed in them, so they would wash their sacrifices or whatever in these uh, five smaller basins. There's some there, and there's some at the top as well. They would wash their offerings and stuff in there, but at the end it says, but the sea was for the priest to wash in. So this first initial big basin, the sea, was for the priest to wash in. Keep that in mind as we go through. Okay, so here's what the tabernacle looked like. Here's what the temple looked like, the outer court. We are going to see 
these three or four items identical in man. And it's not because, oh, well, man is constructed like the temple. No, <laughs> the temple is constructed like man. Man was not made in the image of temple or the tabernacle, but the temple and the tabernacle were made in the image of man. So first we have, obviously, the body, the outer court, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? The Apostle Paul understood that our body is more than, well, it's just dirt that God put together, and what's inside is really what matters. That is true. But what's on the outside really matters too because your body is the temple of God. Remember, God wanted a sanctuary, a sacred, a holy place set aside for him. So our body, even though, yes, it's mortal, it fails, we get old, we can't see, we got to get glasses, and it fails, it's still the temple of the Holy Ghost. It is very important. It's a part of, it's one of the three parts that God created. He made us in his likeness. Our physical body, the outward uh, part of a three-part being is the temple of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. Just as God had specific instructions for the outer part of the tabernacle and Solomon had some very beautiful uh, alterations that he made to the outside of the uh, temple, our physical body is the outer court of the temple of God. It is important to take care of our body, not for selfish reasons or even legalistic reasons. I'm going to share this. We don't take care of our body because, oh, I want to take care of my body so it looks good or so that it's attractive for other people to look at or so I feel better or, you know, whatever that is. Although those are not bad reasons. You do feel better when you take care of your body. You know, I don't think you, I think you shouldn't take care of your body so that people don't think, you know, you represent Lord Jesus Christ. Your outside should look good. If you need some paint on the barn, paint the barn, okay? Although these are good reasons to take care of your body, the number one reason why we take care of our body is because it is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's the temple of God. So that's why it's not for other people. It's not for selfish reasons. It's for us. It's not even for uh, legalistic reasons in the aspect of, well, I don't drink because my pastor says I shouldn't drink, or I don't fornicate because it's a sin against my body and I shouldn't do that, or I can't get tattoos because the Bible says I can't get tattoos, or I can't, whatever it is, or I need to look good because other people are watching me, or I'm expected to look or behave a certain way. Although those may be reasons, that's not the reason why you do it. You don't look and act a certain way with your body because people are looking at you. You do it because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, people are looking at you, and they... You, your, your light is shining through you. But you don't do it for them or for those reasons. You do it because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, right? Our body is the outward part of God's sanctuary. Remember, God said he wanted a sanctuary, a sacred place, a holy place where he could dwell. We should never do anything to the outer part of our sanctuary that would take away from the sacredness and the holiness of God's temple. Just as specific as God was for the temple and the tabernacle on the outward Part, even though that's not where God was dwelling, it's still his temple and it's sacred and it's holy. That's why we should take care of our bodies, right? Okay, so we have the body. Then we have the gate. This is interesting. Acts, again, Acts 4, verse number 20. Peter and John, they're asked in, to stop preaching the gospel. Stop talking about Jesus. Stop telling other people about Jesus. What do Peter and John say? For we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. The gate, which is Jesus Christ, he is the door, he is the only way in. The way our body is constructed, our gate, the way that things come in and out of our temple is through our eyes and through our ears. Although Jesus is the door, the only way to get to heaven, the gate is the way which we allow God into our bodies through the gate of our eyes and the gate of our ears. Here, Peter and John they saw and they heard Jesus Christ and they believed on him. The Spirit of God now dwelled in them because they allowed him into their temple through the gate of their eyes and their ears. If, you, if that's not enough support, Matthew 13, verse number 9, Jesus says, He who hath ears to hear, let him hear. He's not just saying, hey, listen up. He's saying, this information, the way that it's going to get inside of you is by you listening. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. John chapter 20, verse number 4 through 8. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. So this is 
the first day of the week, Resurrection Sunday, right? And stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. Then cometh uh, Simon Peter, who was always going to act first, right? Following him in and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin which was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself and went in the other disciple which came first and saw and believed. The gate in which the gospel entered into John was through his eyes. He had heard what Jesus said was going to happen and he now had saw what had happened, and he believed. The gate in which we allow the Holy Spirit to come in is through our eyes and our ears. It's very important what we look at and what we listen to, because that's the gate to our temple, right? Next, we see the altar, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Just as when you were to, if you were to walk into the tabernacle or to the temple, the first thing that you would see is the altar. You couldn't get around it. When you walked into there, you would have to make an effort to go around this, especially in the temple that Solomon built, 30 by 30 by 15, massive. Here, the writer of Romans says, our bodies are a living sacrifice. When God enters our temple, the first thing that he should see is a living sacrifice being sacrificed on this altar, right? Every day we die to ourselves and we offer ourselves a living sacrifice. Here is something extremely powerful from the book of Leviticus. Yes, there is good stuff in Leviticus. Leviticus 6 12 and 13. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, and it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay burnt offerings in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. All living sacrifices to God are constantly to be burning because we constantly need to offer ourselves our pride, our desires, and our will on this altar. Again, the picture of the temple and the tabernacle, we aren't supposed to be like that. They are like us. So this altar of sacrifice is a constant sacrifice. It's not, well, I gave my heart to the Lord back in, you know, 1964. Okay, that's great that you did that, but I gave my life to Lord Jesus Christ this morning and yesterday and tomorrow because every single day I die to myself, to my desires, to my wills, my ambition. Every single day, this altar of sacrifice needs to be burning constantly. Okay. Next, we see the laver. It is very important for the priests to cleanse themselves physically before they would sacrifice and they went into the temple or the tabernacle, right? It is just as important to wash ourselves before we come to meet with God in his sanctuary. Uh, how do we wash ourselves and what is this labor? Do we have to take a bath before we pray? Uh, do we have to take a shower and so we don't smell? No, this labor is the word of God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. John 15, 3. Now ye are clean through the words which I have spoken unto you. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How do we clean ourselves? The Holy Spirit comes into us. Jesus enters our temple. We have a living sacrifice every day. How do we cleanse ourselves every day in that outer court, our outer body? We cleanse ourselves through the word, reading, listening, meditating, talking about it, hearing, preaching about it. The word of God is the only way to become clean. It's not through self-help, through self-effort. It is the word of God that sanctifies us. Now, remember, the place where the priests would watch, especially in the temple, right? They had this big basin and it was called the sea, right? Micah 7, 19. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast their sins in the depths of the sea. What a beautiful picture of God's cleansing power. The sea, where God casts all of our sin, our iniquities, when we wash ourselves with the word, he cast those in the sea. That's why the basin was there. So all the iniquities, all the sins could be left there before he went and met with God. All of our sin, all of our iniquity, it's confessed to God, it's covered by the word, which is Jesus Christ, and then we can meet with God in his sanctuary. 
God created a sanctuary, a sacred, holy place for him to dwell. He enters this sanctuary permissively through the gate of our eyes and our ears. He finds our bodies, a living sacrifice on the altar. And then finally, he sees that we are clean by the washing of the water, not of self-effort, but through his word. This is the outer court of God's sanctuary. It's what it looked like in the tabernacle and the temple, but it's what it looks like for us. The tabernacle and the temple are symbolic of what we are. God wanted, God did not want a sanctuary for his people. He wanted a people for his sanctuary, right? The tabernacle and the temple, that was God's uh, second option. His first option was man, but man decided he was going to ruin that, right? But Jesus Christ gives us an opportunity to now become the temple of God and dwell in us. That's what he originally wanted. That's how close he wanted to be with us. He wanted to be that close to his people. He didn't want to have to get moved around in a tent. He didn't want to live in a single spot, the temple. He wants to dwell with his people and in his people, right? He wanted to make a nation of priests. Next week, we're going to be looking at uh, the inner part, so inside of the uh, temple tabernacle and inside ourselves. So.